Hello, hello, hello. My name is Shanita Graham, and I'm an associate director on the board of admissions here at Boston University. And I'm joined by my lovely colleague here. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Jade Franco, and I'm an assistant director with BU Financial Assistance. And I'm here to talk about financial aid and also answer your questions. Yes. And so that's what we're here to do. We're here to give you tips advice on how to really engage with the college application process because we know there are a lot of different steps that are involved. Uh, we also will later be joined by some of our wonderful students so you can ask them all the questions about their life here on campus and why they chose BU and any tips and advice they also may have for you. And so start submitting your questions now. You don't have to wait. Um, we want to make sure that when the time comes that we can queue them up and make sure that we get you all the answers to your questions. And so awesome to get us started. We will talk about something you've probably heard before. Uh, and that is the holistic review process. And so that is how we approach reviewing applications in our Office of Admission. Uh, we want to make sure that we are looking at you through the lens of everything that embodies you as a student, um, from the classes you've taken, um, the grades you've gotten, the extracurricular activities that you're involved in, things that you do to develop your character, their test scores, your writing, um, your recommendation letters, all of these different pieces of the process that really will make up what your student journey has been for four years. And so that's how we approach the process. We feel like that's the fairest way um, and the most reflective way to really understand who you are as a student and uh, what we may be able to provide to you as an institution. All right, so now we get to tips that we have. So there's a few different things that we'll talk about, and these are, obviously this is not the entire application process, but these are just some things that um, are very important and that sometimes may get overlooked or may be confusing for students. And so my first uh, piece of advice is around the Common App Activity section. So sometimes you'll see students approach this differently depending on uh, sort of how they understand the section to be. It really is somewhat like a resume. We want you to list all of the activities that have formed you and have really impacted you over the course of four years. So that can be you know, playing a sport, that can be being a part of a club or organization in your school. It can also be babysitting younger siblings, being involved in any uh, initiatives in your community. It can be helping out with your parents, uh, a job that you work. It really can be anything that you've done that develops you as a person. Uh, and so we always tell students, really sit down and think, because you've done a lot in your four years. Um, you may not Remember it off the top of your head or, or think about it too often, but take the time to sit down and really um, consider all that you've done over four years. And so that's the activity section. You can also upload a resume, um, but we would still encourage you make sure you fill out that section um, of the Common App. And then other pieces of advice are around our supplemental essay that we have for Boston University and our recommendation letters that we require. And so with the supplemental essay, it's really just a paragraph um, of you explaining why you think you'd be a good fit for Boston University. Now, my tip and my advice to students is that if you can remove the name Boston University and replace it with another Boston area school and it still makes sense, scrap it, go back to the drawing boards. You really want to make sure that it's specific to Boston University, that you've done your research, that you've asked your questions here today and gotten some answers um, that have really made you feel connected to BU. And so it should be specific around academic things you might be interested in, uh, clubs and organizations, uh, professors and research that they've done, um, initiatives that we have here at BU. Um, they really should be specific. So that's the supplemental essay portion. Um, it shouldn't just say, I love Boston. You know, we love Boston. Boston's a great city, but you want to make sure it's specific to Boston University. And then recommendation letters. You want to make sure that you sit down with your recommenders and get a feel for really what they think about your performance in their classroom or uh, your impact in your school community. And so we require one teacher recommendation letter and one guidance counselor. And so my only advice around that is 
start the process earlier rather than later, giving your recommenders time to really think about your impact on what your journey has been. Um, and it gives you time to check in with them to make sure that um, they're moving along pretty smoothly. So sit down, get a good look. Um, you don't have to choose the teacher that has necessarily given you the A++, but someone who really has seen what your growth and development was in the class. Maybe you hit a hardship in how you overcame that uh, and just how you approached learning uh, new things and, and being a student essentially. And so that's the recommendation process and tips there. Next, we will talk about official versus unofficial test scores. Uh, this is something that comes up for us every cycle um, and really changes year to year. But at Boston University, we require official test scores, which means that they are sent to us directly from the College Board or ACT. Now, sometimes we know students may come across issues um, financially in terms of submitting them. Um, if anything comes up where you feel like you cannot send us official test scores via those um, organizations, you reach out to us and let us know. Um, and we, on a case-by-case -case basis, can you know, work with students to see if you might be able to send us a copy that has been signed by a guidance counselor or a community-based organization that you're a part of. But our default and what we prefer is that test scores officially come through College Board or the ACT. So feel free to reach out to us and know that the door is open and we're here to chat um, if there needs to be a different arrangement made. Now, application fee waiver. So speaking, you know, along the lines of finances, because that is a part of the college application process. And we'll talk about, <laughs> we'll we'll talk talk about, about that. that. Uh, application fee waivers. You can also reach out to us if you don't have a NACAC fee waiver or um, any other ones. You can talk to us. You can send us an email. You can reach out. You can always request it on your Common App and also follow up with us to say, hey, um, is there any way possible? I've run out of fee waivers, but I would really love to apply to Boston University and financial um, restrictions, you know, are present. You can let us know and we can also work with you around that. We don't, our job and what we try to focus on are removing barriers to students being able to apply and get the financial aid that mm -hmm. um, you need to have. So that's what we work to do. So speaking of <laughs> financial aid, uh, Please, what tips and advice do you have for students around approaching what is a, a pretty complicated process at times? Yes. Thank you for the segue. <laughs> so um, just to further clarify my role here at BU, my job is reviewing your answers to the CSS profile and the FAFSA. I review those responses and then our office, along with each of the assistant directors who look at your information, then make you an offer based on those responses based on your family's need. So <laughs> with that in consideration, again, please send your comments right now if you have any, because there's not too many times you get to talk to someone who will look at your answers and then make offers based on that. So please send your questions. Um, biggest tip, number one, please do everything on time. That is the biggest thing. And by on time, do it early because uh, <laughs> I don't know if some of y'all heard this, but the CSS profile had issues on the, the November 1st deadline day. The website decided to crash. Perfect time. So <laughs> The perfect time. So I strongly recommend that you finish your FAFSA and your CSS profile application before the last day, because that day you and millions of other students across the country or the world are trying to press submit and the websites love to crash and they like to have problems. So on top of this, on top of this, many universities, including Boston University, our lovely staff take a winter break right before the, <laughs> the deadline. So um, if you have a problem and you try to call us or try to call any other university you're applying to, you might not be able to get timely help. So again, please do things early. If you missed the boat on the November 1st deadline, if you applied for the ED1, Send it in. We might still look at it. I can't make a 100% guarantee, but if you miss that deadline for any reason, please contact our office immediately. Our email address is finaid, F-I-N-A-I-D, at bu.edu. And you can also find our information on our website, bu.edu slash finaid. Call us for any questions you may have. Another second tip that I have is 
being able to make sure you gather all the financial documents that are going to be necessary for filling out the FAFSA and the profile. Trying to kind of just do it like a little bit here today, a little bit here tomorrow can be pretty overwhelming. And I find that it's easier if you just go to the websites ahead of time. There's usually a section on each website about what questions they will be asking and what documents you need. For the most part, you need copies of 2017 federal tax returns from your parents or legal guardians. And you'll also need to establish a FSA ID for your family, for both a parent or guardian and yourself before doing the FAFSA. So you want to make sure that you take care of these pieces and you see what you need to do before you start the applications. Just clicking on it blindly doesn't, it's not the best way to start. So take some time to see what is required. Uh, the CSS profile on average for, for most families and students takes between two to three hours to fill out with all the information gathered in one location for you to sit down and answer every question because they're going to ask about the value of your home, the value of any businesses that you have, the your cars, uh, your cars <laughs> um, projected year income. It's going to ask you information that you personally might not know and that your parents might need to look up. So, again, please go to the CSS profile website. It's the same people that manage the SAT, the College Board, and see what questions they'll ask you so that you can gather the right documents before starting. The FAFSA should be faster. Um, if you're able to use the IRS data retrieval tool, that will save you a lot of headaches. <laughs> um, again, you'll need the 2017 federal tax returns for that. But if your family is able to use that IRS data retrieval, it'll import the responses that were sent to the IRS and put it directly into the FAFSA. That will prevent there being mistakes or errors on your application, which is a big deal. So please, if you're eligible for the data importation, use it. Um, a few more tips of advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, on the CSS profile, there is a box called special circumstances. Write something in it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there is a box there because our office and most financial aid offices can't see what you wrote to admissions. So what you tell Shanita or another reviewer of your application about your life circumstances, I'm not going to have access to that. I have no access to what's going on. I can't see who wrote your recommendation letters. I can't see if your mom has only one job or if your father got laid off. I have no idea about that. You have to tell us that in the special circumstances box. So if there was a change in your home circumstances, if your family experienced losses because of natural disasters or your grand your grandparents are sick and your parents are helping to pay for that or anything like that that you think is something a financial aid office should know so that we can make a different offer to you you want to put that in there if you have any questions about what type of circumstance to talk about you can call our office you can call us anytime <laughs> <laughs> you can call us anytime and ask um, because we want to be able to give you an offer that is going to uh, best help. We don't meet 100% of need, unfortunately, for all students, meaning that we're not the type of school that promises that X number that you get on the FAFSA, the estimated family contribution, that will 100% meet that. We try our best. However, if you tell us information that might sway things one way or another, depending on your circumstances, that really helps us. Um, and the last thing I'll say is a lot of folks forget about the non-custodial profile information. <laughs> don't. So don't, so don't yeah. Don't, don't be there. <laughs> um, what you need to know is if your parents are not together, we ask about all adults that were involved in your uh, formation or uh, upbringing. So that means that we're going to ask if your parents are separated. Let's say you live with your dad and your mom lives elsewhere and she's remarried or something like that. We're going to need information about them and their income in order to determine a parental contribution that influences how much aid we offer you. If you don't have contact with this other parent or you don't know who they are, you need to tell us this. There's an application waiver on our website. It's the same waiver application that's on the CSS profile website. It's called 
waiver requests for non-custodial parent information. And in that form, you have to be very specific and you have to provide supporting documentation to ask us to not count their information. So let's say you don't you have no idea who that other parent is or it's not safe to contact them or um, they're they're facing some other circumstance. They're very disabled and you're not able to provide information for them, whatever it is. You want to make sure you document that in the form and submit it to our office. Again, if you have questions about this, please call us. Please email us. finaid at bu.edu is our email address. Um, but if you do have contact with your non-custodial parent uh, or the other biological or adoptive parent, their information is required. On the CSS profile, there is an area where you can put their contact information and their email, and the CSS profile will send them a reminder to complete the information on your behalf. And you can put it in as many times as possible. You can do it every day to remind them <laughs> to fill it out. <laughs> yes, do what you need to do. Um, and if they say, I don't do computer paper applications, there's a paper not custodial profile. There's ways. So no excuses. We need we either need the information or you need to be approved to have it waived. There's no in between. So if you have any questions about about that, please contact our office. And just to piggyback off of a point that Jade made around explaining your situation, that's the same for your common application. If there are anything, things in there that you think would be red flags to us, let us know. You know, it's regular people like this, like us on the other end, reading your applications, whether it's for admission or financial mm -hmm. aid, and we can be understanding. So we just need to know your situation. So whether you talk about issues in your personal statement or the additional information section in the common application, or if your recommenders are familiar with your situation and they can speak to it, use the opportunities to better inform us of what has been going on. So if there are dips in your grades in particular years, if you have had a downward trend in your grades, uh, if there are several different schools, we sometimes see that. Uh, or if there are classes that you had to retake over the summer or online, anything that, you know, you think may not just be automatically understood by us reading it on the other end, let us know. That's your best bet is to be transparent um, and to really just tell us what your story has been. Yeah. Similarly, if you've got some kind of weird family thing, we've seen anything and everything here in our office. Let's say both of your parents are living in another country They sent you to live with your grandma but then they never filled out any official paperwork and who knows and you might think that's yeah. weird and that's something that is completely normal to yeah. us and that we see all the time so yeah there isn't anything that would be strange or out of the ordinary at this point for us so share your story and yeah. know Tell that us. you're mm -hmm. probably in good company and don't worry about it mm -hmm. we'll we'll help you work through it and so we've talked about financial aid um, I want to give you some last tips on the application process for admission, just because we have some deadlines that are coming up that will also make sure that we, we give you information about that as well. And so final tips, uh, as Jade was mentioning, you may have applied uh, for our early decision one deadline, which was the beginning of this month, very, very beginning of this month. And uh, we also have another early decision deadline, which overlaps with our regular decision deadline. That is January 2nd. Uh, and what's great about early decision is that, one, you're demonstrating your interest in a much greater way. Uh, you're committing because early decision is binding. You're saying that I've done my research. I've, I've had my questions answered and I am committed to attending this school if I'm admitted. And so that's a big deal. And we encourage students to you know, talk it over with their families, with your school community, maybe your guidance counselor, uh, because we want to make sure that it is the right decision for you. And but also why I do want to talk about it is because sometimes there's fear around doing early decision because of the financial component. And that's completely fair for students and families to be concerned about that. But we're here to give you some tips and highlight some things. So uh, for folks who are worried about that, the only difference with early decision in terms of financial aid is that you will receive a financial aid package. You and your family will get to determine whether or not that will work for you. 
whether or not it has gapped you a substantial amount. And this is for any school that you would apply to. You get to determine that. You just don't get to shop around and look at many other financial aid packages and compare and contrast if that school will give you an extra 500 or that school will give you an extra thousand dollars. You don't get to do that. But right written in the early decision agreement, when you sign it on Common App, it says to you that if for financial reasons, if this is unable to work for you and your family, you can be removed from the binding nature of early decision. You will need to call our folks over in financial aid and talk to them so they can see, you know, what what might work based on the information we've received from you, what could work and what couldn't. Uh, that's the only difference. So if if it could work for your family and maybe you need an extra 500 or a thousand, you can always do an appeal. Uh, and that will be reviewed by our office of financial aid to see if, you know, if they can approve it or not. Uh, but that's the only difference is you wouldn't be able to shop around. The benefits, however, of applying early decision are that, as I mentioned, you're demonstrating your interest in a much stronger way but you also are able to be reviewed within a much smaller group. You're not being compared to our entire application uh, pool of over 64,000 applicants that we received last year. Uh, and so you're being reviewed within a much smaller pool. So that's great. And also we're more flexible and more lenient with our admissions requirements for students applying early decision. If you look at our profile for admitted students early decision versus regular decision, we, we offer a good amount of flexibility there. Uh, and so students who are sometimes concerned about our SAT or ACT profile, uh, our GPA averages, you can get a little more flexibility. One, if you're applying early decision, but also if you are interested in one of our programs called our College of General Studies. Our College of General Studies Boston London program is a what I like to call um, a program for students to complete their liberal arts requirements, essentially. Uh, students in this program will begin their freshman year in January, and then they actually will go to London that summer to complete their freshman year credit. So it's our earliest study abroad program. Students love that about it because then you have another three years to study abroad again if it will fit into your schedule and if you would like to. And so within the College of General Studies, it's just a two-year program. It's just a much more structured and hands-on experience. We refer to it typically as our small liberal arts college and our large research institution. Professors are more collaborative you're in a cohort model, there's even a residential component for students who are interested, and it just gives students an opportunity to have the more hands-on connection if that's what they're accustomed to or that uh, would benefit them in terms of an educational environment. There is a research component at the end of the two years. Also, while you're in this very structured program where two to three of your courses each semester are already pre-selected, you are still taking one or two courses each semester that align with the major that you would be interested in going into. So after the two years, if you are interested in going from College of General Studies to our College of Arts and Sciences, for example, to become a biology major or our College of Arts, our College of General Studies to our College of Communication to become a film and television major, um, you can do that. You'll have been taking classes along the way that align with that major. You'll then transition into that school or college, into that major, and be able to graduate within four years. And so it can be a great opportunity for students who um, would benefit from more structure in their first two years of college mm -hmm. who want that smaller learning environment and who also wouldn't mind going to London their freshman year. So it's pretty it's nice. Pretty nice. <laughs> uh, and so that's one program um, that we offer that we are also more lenient with our admissions requirements because of the structured nature of the program that students would be entering into. So those are just my tips. Um, if you are looking for different ways to go about approaching the application mm -hmm. process and uh, which different programs you would apply to. So those are our tips. Any final tips before we call our students over? No, just those deadlines. Just do things on time. Do it early. Yes. Do it early. And we will show you the slide here yes. so you can see what our deadlines are. We've made our admission deadlines mirror our financial aid deadlines. Mm -hmm. So just to remove any confusion, um, and also just to make sure that you're getting all these things done on time. So please keep them in mind. And now for our next piece, we are going to call over our students to join us because that's really who you want to hear from. They're living, breathing students here and they're great. So we're going to shift over some, let them get front and center and we'll ask them some questions. Yeah. <laughs> 
students here. Awesome. So I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, they know how the introduction goes. So they'll introduce themselves and then we'll kick off with our first question. Hello, everyone. My name is Tatiana DeRosa. I'm from Brockton, Massachusetts. I'm a current junior at BU in our College of Arts and Sciences, studying biology on the pre-veterinary track, and I'm also a business management minor in our Question School of Business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <So> wow. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Esther Clayton. I am from New York and I am a junior also in the College of Arts and Sciences studying political science and I also have a minor in our College of Communication studying mass communications and public relations. Ooh, you already know these are some busy young ladies here <laughs> and so we'll get started by asking why be you? Why out of all the different schools um, you could have attended, what made you choose BU? Um, yeah, let's start there. Yeah, so for me, I went to a relatively large high school, around 4,500 kids. So I knew that I could make, or I knew that I wanted to go to a large institution because I found that I can make a big school small, but you can't make a small school big. And I knew that at BU, I would just find small communities and niches in which I have, where you just kind of naturally fit into the people that you are um, connecting with, whether it be because of culture, identity, interest, things like that. And it's just really nice because I also found that you've just, meet so many different types of people that there's no such thing as a typical BU student where there's like no external pressure to like fit in some specific mold. It's actually quite the opposite um, where BU is constantly encouraging students to like be their own person and all that fun stuff. So I knew that I want to go to a large dynamic community um, and really just be able to kind of not only learn within the classroom, but also learn from my peers outside the classroom and meet like all different types of people, all different types of like walks of life. Yeah, I think that my reason was a little similar to that. Um, except I went to a really small school um, for high school, so I didn't have that many kids. Um, I knew everyone in all of the grades, no matter what kind of thing. And it was great in terms of creating a community and feeling that sense of identity. But also I knew that I wanted to, I wanted something more. I wanted something bigger and broader. Um, so I knew that I definitely wanted a large institution. I wanted to go somewhere where I had a city and I had access to different um, resources outside in like the general city of Boston. And that's something BU is great for, connecting you to different places in Boston and not just staying on campus. And I also knew that I really wanted sort of a global perspective. And on my tour, when I first um, applied here, my tour guide really stressed studying abroad as well as the different opportunities that we have on campus to work with different spaces outside of campus. So I liked all of those things about BU. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So we have our first question that has come in. Talk to us about living on campus. What is it like? What's the process in terms of residence halls here, the food? You know, we know you want to know about the food. <laughs> you know, and just... And also tell us your favorite place on campus. Okay. Um, I can start. Um, so for uh, initially getting to live on campus, you first apply um, to like housing. And when you're applying to housing, there's like um, different regions of campus that you can choose to live in. Um, and BU is a pretty long campus around like a mile long or so. And so I wanted to take advantage of the fact that it was pretty long, where I knew a lot of my classes would be in our eastern portion of campus, where most of the academic buildings are housed there. So I really wanted to live in our western portion of campus, just because I liked the fact and wanted to take advantage of the fact that I could have distance between my home and school. And so that's something I really, really like about BU. And like I chose my roommate um, on like a Facebook page that my like that my year created, where the only thing I posted was like, "Hey, I'm Tati. I like to listen to Drake and want to live in our western portion of campus." <laughs> Up. And, and so she did, and now, and so um, my freshman year roommate name was Alex. We were the best of friends, and it was really, really great. And then um, I went abroad, and then when I came back onto campus, I got pulled in by one of my friends that I had met um, previously. And basically, the pulling in process with um, you is that once you're like past freshman year, um, you're put in like a lottery um, like phase. Thing where like um, seniors get um, priority but then with that you can get grouped into um, with, with other friends so that you can be pulled into like different other parts of campus that you kind of have a more choice in terms of where you're living and so I got pulled in by a friend and then I stayed in that same room that she pulled me in for this semester and pulled in my other friends so it's really easy to kind of just have um, community within your own living space because it's just like a really flexible um, thing with a lot of options and housing being guaranteed all four years as well and so that's kind of like 
a good rundown about housing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was actually the friend that she pulled in. <laughs> <laughs> we are currently roommates. <laughs> Hi. Um, and I love the space that we're living in now. One thing that I like about the housing in general is the fact that you get a very different vibe and different positives. Um, depending on what space and campus that you're living in. So whether you're living in Far East, you have the best dining hall. <laughs> if you're living in Far West, you get such great access to sports and our um, Aganis Arena, which where we have hockey and um, concerts and things like that, or the gym. And then if you're living sort of in Central and our Warren Towers for freshmen, then you're really close to all of your colleges. So there are different um, great aspects of living in each part of campus. I used to live in Central, now I live in West, and I feel like next year I'm definitely you don't want to live in East. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely positives to the different years and where you're living on campus. Yeah, and as far as like my favorite spaces on campus, even though I've always lived in our western portion of campus, I do find myself hanging out more in central portion just because um, no matter where people are living, no matter where people are going from to classes or things like that, it's a perfect center stop and it's like nice to kind of just have that one location where everyone can kind of conjoin. And the main space for that is called our George Sherman Union, which is kind of like our main student union here on campus. And my favorite space is within our basement of the um, George Sherman Union. It's called the Howard Thurman Center, where basically um, Howard Thurman is actually the first black dean at a predominantly white institution. And he was an advisor to one of our alumni, Martin Luther King Jr. Don't know if you've heard of him. Um, but basically, <laughs> with Howard Thurman, he has kind of like a philosophy of um, what we call common ground, where essentially no matter what race, gender, sexual orientation, any of that stuff that you may identify with, all students on campus can find common ground with one another. And that's an idea that everyone learns here on campus, really helping to make sure that our large student body body population knows that they're accepted for who they are and all that fun stuff and so it really just is like a comfort blanket that everyone has and so within that space a lot of our cultural groups are there um, putting on performances and exposés it's a big place for like open conversation and things like that and it's just like also like a nice study space to just go to and hang out again if you're in the middle of classes and I don't like want to go all the way back to west um, to head home for the day I can just kind of hang out there a little pit stop and know that I can see all of my friends and also kind of just meet a new face as well. Right. And there's also food above, which is definitely yeah. a great pull. So you can get food above, come downstairs, eat, talk to someone, have conversations, stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. So for our next question, let us talk about internships and jobs. How are you all making the dollars? Uh, how are you planning to make the dollars? Talk to us about that. Okay, I'll yeah, you can <laughs> so um, in terms of jobs on campus, it's actually really easy to get um, jobs. There's a lot of different like ways to get on jobs, whether it's through work study or you just find it on your own. I personally don't have a work study, but I know a lot of my friends do, and like they um, have like a kind of set. Um, positions that they can apply to, but you can also just apply to um, places that have openings. I actually currently have four jobs on campus, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. Um, I currently work as a student admissions representative in the admissions office, um, and that's a paid position where I work around 13 hours a week. I also am a teaching assistant for um, financial statistics on campus, where my only requirement is to like hold off what we call office hours on campus, which are like designated times in which outside of the classroom you can go and meet with either professors, teaching fellows, or teaching assistants to kind of learn more about the um, topics that you're learning about in class. So I really just like am like tutoring kids with homework and stuff. And so that's another paid position. I'm also a Scarlet speaker in which um, BU houses different um, information sessions. And I'm one of the students that can um, speak. And that's like only an hour and a half a week commitment. And I also work at a chicken place called Raising Cane's, which is pretty <laughs> unique to the Northeast, where um, the closest one to BU is like in Ohio. And so I started working there freshman year because it, it was like really close to where I was living on campus. It was like a two minute walk from where I live. And you get free chicken. And so it was just like really easy. And so I was just like, hey, can I work here? And, uh, and so now like I have those four positions and they're really like flexible. They know that you're a student first. And so they're really like um, easy with like all that stuff. And it really is just like a seamless um, thing to add into your schedule if you do want to make a little extra cash here and there. Right. I definitely agree with that. I actually work on at our on-campus Pinkberry. Um, so I serve <laughs> frozen yogurt, which is a great job. They uh, definitely understand your schedule. Um, they change things around for uh, finals time. So you're never stressed about having to go to work and also study a fi for a final and things like that. So I really um, do recommend having an on-campus job because they make it really accommodating for you to go to class and do work. Another thing that I wanted to 
talk about was our career services. We definitely have a lot of different career services for um, if you're trying to get an internship for the summer, if you're trying to get an internship during the school year. And um, we have general career services as well as in our specific colleges. And that's one of the things that I've actually used um, to help look for internships for my next summer. Um, as I said, I'm a minor in the College of Communications, and so I've been going to different career panels and things like that, where they have alumni come in um, from different places that might have to do with your major, and they talk about their job, what they do, how that related to their time at BU, and how they, um, what they've learned during their major um, that help that they apply to during their actual job position, and then as well as that, they have networking services, things like that, and they're all really um, great ways to find an internship for the summer, find a possible job after college, which is something that we're definitely all thinking about. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, add one more thing. so just about the work study, important thing to know, on the FAFSA, in order to be offered work study, you have to say yes, that you want to be offered work study. If you say no or I don't know, our office reads I don't know as no. Okay, so <laughs> yes means yes, I don't know means no, and no means no. All right. Okay. okay, so we'll throw another question to you all, and then we'll talk some more about early decision and financial aid. So talk to us about what resources exist on campus for um, students of color, underrepresented minorities. What, what resources, whether it's community, academic, uh, social, anything like that? Yeah, I've already kind of touched upon the Howard Thurman Center, and that's a huge, huge resource for a lot of um, uh, students of color here on campus. But also, personally, I've used um, what we call First Gen Connect on campus. So I, myself, am a first-generation student, meaning that I'm the first person in my family to have a higher education. And so coming in as a freshman, that was something that was really daunting to me because I'm the first person to ever do this, so I didn't have anyone above me to give me advice, essentially. And so that was kind of a big worry um, in terms of my transition from high school to college, but um, when I came to BU as an admitted student during our Multicultural Community Weekend, I asked a lot of um, other first-generation students who currently attend BU, like the different resources that they have, and they pointed out a class that's offered for all freshmen called FY101, which is like a first-year experience class. It's an hour a week where all you're doing in the class is like essentially receiving advice, and you're just with a bunch of other freshmen, and you, you have like a peer mentor, so a current student, and then you also have like a professional, a professional faculty member teaching that class and so I took FI 101 and I took the section specifically for first generation students so every other freshman in the class was also first gen my faculty members were first gen my peer mentor was first gen and so it was just really nice to have people who were in the exact same boat as me going through this exact same thing that I'm going through at the exact same time and constantly having that open conversation and communication and that sense of I'm not alone and so that's something that's really really important that um, I know maybe for a lot of other first gen students out there that might be worried about that's something that BU really kind of hones in and then through first gen connect they always are hosting a bunch of different events on campus for first gen students to kind of connect with each other and connect with the different resources that are available on campus. Isn't it been on Thursday right? There is yes or, I think it's national first gen oh, student day. Yeah I like got uh, the email I haven't read through yeah. it yet but yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Um, another resource that I kind of want to highlight is a little different because it's actually a student group on campus and it's called our Minority Connection, Connection Initiative. Um, and basically it was created a couple of years ago and its entire focus is making such a big school um, that might seem a little daunting feel a little bit smaller for the minority specifically on campus. So they hold professor office hours where they have a different um, professor of color in one of any of our colleges come and talk to us about what they've been doing, the research that they've been doing, um, the kind of things that they're involved with on campus that might not have to do with research, whether it's um, being an, an advisor for a different club or something like that. So they come talk to us about that. They also work to connect grad students as well as professors with undergraduate students so they can find more access to things like research or things, um, just general advice for an undergraduate student that might be looking to go into a certain career field. So that's something that's definitely be supported and really useful for me in terms of meeting new faculty that I wouldn't have met otherwise, as well as getting to know a lot of different other minority students. Awesome. So, we heard there was a question around early decision and what we had talked about before around financial aid. And so a lot of students and families, as we mentioned before, have concerns, right? If you're signing what is a contract that says you will attend a school if you are admitted, 
a big part of that is can you afford it? And so we understand that. And so what I was mentioning before is that if you apply early decision to a school, you're only to apply early decision to one school uh, at a time. You apply early decision, you're admitted, you receive a financial aid package. Once you review it with your family and you take into account what your answers on the FAFSA were, what your answers on the CSS profile were, um, how much financial aid the school provides, once you factor those things in and your family situation, if you cannot afford it, if your family cannot make the payments, it would not be able to work for your family, you can call our office and speak to financial aid and really talk through, hey, this is why this will not work for us. Um, I know maybe this answer in the CSS profile indicated this, but we actually help support uh, grandparents or we send money back to um, the country where we're from, or um, actually these things have shifted and we just cannot make this work. If that is the case, we are not here to hang you up and to, you know, make you come here and you can't afford it. That's not something we want. And so you would be able to be removed from the binding nature of the early decision agreement. Um, that means we will not um, chase you down and hunt you down if you're deciding that you cannot attend Boston University uh, based on the financial aid that you've been provided. Then we can understand that um, and that can be fine. We just, again, we're not here to make you have to take semesters off or struggle financially um, in order to receive your education. That's not at all what we want. So you can always have a conversation with us um, about what will work for your family and what will not. Um, I'd only add to that that once you receive the financial aid offer, offer you if you need more, <laughs> if you're looking at this and think uh, this is not enough, you should contact our office immediately. Um, we need to hear back from early decision candidates, usually within a 15 day window before you would have to make the decision if you're going to accept the offer or if you're going to withdraw from that offer, if we want to reconsider you from additional aid. So that's really important. I've seen some families deposit and say, yes, we're going to come and then ask for more money. That doesn't make a stronger case for you. In fact, it shows that, okay, you're going to come and the financial aid offer maybe wasn't that important because you did decide to deposit after all. So if you're in between that, I would say appeal first and ask for more aid and see if our office can't consider some of the circumstances that are happening in your household. If a few thousand dollars would make a difference, not like $20,000, guys, <laughs> but, you know, like a, a, a smaller, more modest number would make a difference because um, we can consider those uh, requests. So just send that to us in writing, finaid at bu.edu with the full name of the student and the BU ID that is assigned to your application. Awesome. All right, now to shift back to our wonderful students, mm -hmm. talk to us about study abroad, uh, whether it's trips you've gone on or plan to go on or your friends have gone on, what the process is, uh, and just how awesome it is at BU. Time. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I've already gone um, on a study abroad trip. I was a part of the Madrid Science Program my fall semester of my sophomore year, where basically I took all the same science classes I would have had to take for my biology major, such as um, organic chemistry, statistics, um, cellular biology, which doesn't really sound fun here, but I promise you it was a blast having it there. Um, and basically with that process, there are... Um, a bunch of different study abroad programs that cater to different majors, and I believe that every major has an abroad, pro abroad program that can accompany it. And so for me, I went on more so of a uh, abroad program that kind of just catered toward my major, and kind of that was it. I just was there to take classes and more so immerse into the culture. So I also had a host family while I was there, and they took care of me. They did my laundry. They fed me, they helped me with my fluency in Spanish, and so it was really, really fun. And it's just an opportunity that I really wanted to take early on in my career because I really um, wanted to kind of take advantage of the fact that BU allows us to be such global citizens. Like I said, I am from Massachusetts. I've lived here my whole life, and so going to school here um, didn't really present much of a culture shock, and I kind of wanted to experience one. And so when I found that I could easily put that into my academic pathway without having to take any extra classes, without graduating any later, without it having a hindrance on my financial aid package, it was like a perfect um, opportunity for me, and so I took advantage of that. And I got to travel to different countries while being in Spain. Um, I went to places 
like Morocco and Italy and Portugal. And so now I have some of my best memories with that semester um, to the point where I'm actually going to study abroad again next semester um, in Quito, Ecuador, and be a part of our tropical ecology program, which is another program designed for biology students. And this one is actually research based. So within this program, I'll be doing a lot of different research in different tropical mountains of Ecuador. And then by the end of each um, like major project that we do uh, to be able to present a lot of my findings. And at the very end, I'm going to have my own capstone project in which it's like going to be a research paper in which I'm going to be like published for and things like that. So really excited to do that. And we have like a two week trip to the Galapagos. And if you know anything about biology, you know, that's where Charles Darwin did all his study with the finches. And so, so, so excited. Um, probably the best opportunity I will have as a biology major. And again, not having any hindrance on um, my academic pathway, not any hindrance on financial aid and so super super recommend it love it so much very very excited <laughs> um i have not studied abroad yet but i am going abroad next semester actually just like tati i'm actually going to london england which i'm so excited about i've never been to europe before much less london so i'm really excited to be able to once again travel and one of the great things about our study abroad program is that they know that you're going away and they know that you're excited about all the different access that you're going to have to different countries so that's also built into your program so you're going to have time to travel they're giving you extra days off so that you can go see italy or go see france or whatever it is and i'm actually Actually going for the political science program and a part of that program we also get to travel to different to see different um, governmental structures so not only is it built in time for me to travel I'm also getting graded to travel which is amazing um, one of the other things that I'd like to highlight about that program and about a lot of the other programs that BU offers when it comes to study abroad is the fact that you can study abroad and have an internship attached to it and um, as I said I'm going to London for political science so I get to take a political science internship I get to get credits for that internship and it is also such a great resume booster to be able to say that you worked with um, a campaign in um, a different country for a different um, governmental structure it shows versatility and things like that and it definitely boosts your strength for any job that you're applying to afterwards um, and as Tati said you don't have to take extra classes afterwards or anything like that you're still on track to graduate um, in your four years and so it's a great opportunity all around basically Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so a question we get a lot of the time and it can be answered pretty differently, I've seen uh, by BU students and just by the I think the culture of BU. What are some BU traditions? Okay. You got one? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank I, you guys. <laughs> Jump I have two yes. and they're both food related. I'm very excited. <laughs> So the first one that I found out about when I came here and I was floored is the fact that we have a lobster night every year. And just think about it for a second. This is a huge university. <laughs> we have multiple different dining halls in different corners of campus. And the fact that one night, fall semester, every year, every student who has a dining plan can go into one of those dining halls and get lobster and you don't have to pay extra for it blows my mind. <laughs> amazing it's the best day for me a fall semester i love it um and it's also like a great bonding experience because you go in you see everyone messy with the butter and everything you're wearing a bib with a lobster <laughs> you're cracking open the huge lobster it's hilarious and everyone gets messy it's a great time and it's definitely a bonding moment for um everyone in our community which so i love that and lobster i love that um and the second one that i have is actually for freshmen and it is what is it midnight breakfast that yeah. we have I remember freshman year. I wish I could go back because I remember the excitement of getting up like um, after studying and going over to one of our dining halls and being able to be out at midnight and have it be an organized activity. And there are games. You get to eat breakfast, things like that. It's always a fun time. And the fact that it's just freshmen allows you to bond with your class, which is also great. So. Yeah, that is cute. <laughs> the one that I really like enjoy, even though I'm not superstitious, is that we have what we call our Boss University Seal, which is in a region of campus called Marsh Plaza, which is actually like the geographic center of campus, which is really cool. And so the legend behind the seal is, is that um, it's basically like a pretty big um, circle platform on the ground it takes a good amount of space yeah. and but the legend behind it is that as an undergraduate if you step on the seal you won't graduate within four years and so people dodge that thing like it's on fire like <laughs> if i see anyone go like even an inch 
close to the seal. I'm like, get away. What are you doing? You are de- <laughs> like detrimental to your future. Don't do that. And so even though I'm not superstitious, I just don't mess with it. Like, I don't want any yeah. bad juju. Yeah. But that's kind of just, <laughs> 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 like, I just don't want to do that to myself. But you um, want to <laughs> no, but apparently um, BU um, has this day, though, where, like, once you are graduating, they, like, um, have, like, photographers out um, on Mars Plaza so that you can actually take pictures of yourself stepping on the seal for the first time. So, like, not only are you getting your diploma, which is, like, what you're here for, but you get yeah. to step on the seal. And <laughs> I am so excited to do that. Right. I'm, like, it's, like, something that I, like, it's, like, a, what is it called? Oh, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for, but it's, like, a deep desire in myself to like step on the seal for the first oh, time. Yeah. So I'm holding out on that and that's like probably my favorite tradition. It's actually so funny. There will be hordes of people like going to class, this is this is not like that's walking so around, everyone parts way for the seal. Like you will not you will see respect literally the seals seal. of people walking around so you respect the seal. Honestly. So yeah, I'm pretty excited. Ooh. All right, so to shift gears somewhat uh, to the classroom. Yeah. Talk to us about and, and feel free to be completely honest yeah. about the diversity found in faculty mm-hmm. that you've either had or your friends have had, um, connections with, with faculty members of color, just what has that process been like? Um, for me personally, in terms of professors that I have that I've had in the STEM field, it's pretty much um, standard for it to be essentially dominated by white males it's kind of like the typical thing that you just see within the STEM field so I've actually had the honor to have a bunch of um different types of professors within my general STEM classes a lot of them being female um only one being a, a professor of color but within that we have um teaching fellows that are for all of um specifically STEM classes that all classes have teaching fellows that are graduate students working underneath the professor who like went to school to either teach or are still very involved in their field. And almost all of my teaching fellows have been um, students of color. So that's been really nice. And just in general, the way that teaching fa- um, faculty work on campus is that they're there to not only be the person who has the same essential like knowledge as your professor, but because they're still a little bit younger, they're also people that you just kind of can relate to a lot easier. A lot of them are still in their first or second years of graduate school. So it's like nice to have them be um, people that have recently are, have gone through what you're going through now and for me to have a lot of them be um, people of color has definitely showed me that my goal of getting to grad school and my goal of like doing a lot of research and things like that makes that a little bit more obtainable um, so in terms of direct um, professors I haven't had too many but again with the professors professor office hours that um, our club multi, um, minority connection initiative has done. I've met a lot of professors of color outside of my STEM classes that have been really, really helpful um, connections because I am interested in more than just STEM. I am, I do have like my business minor. And so there have been a lot of um, faculty um, within the question school of business that are of color as well that have been really cool resources that I've gotten to interact with. Right. I definitely agree with that. Um, as a political science student, I find that there's a little bit more color than I think the STEM field has in terms of professors, but I would say um, it is majority, I'd actually say white females, which is a little bit of a different perspective because while they're not of color, they definitely do understand um, certain aspects of being a minority in this country especially, which is nice. And one of the other things that I like about my field when it comes to professors is that because it's discussion based as a lot of the classes at BU are, you're able to open the um, conversation to different discussions about diversity, especially in this political climate, Um, like today's voting day. Exactly. (laughs) Um, So you see so many people with the I voted stickers and things like that and the conversations (laughs) that I've been having in class about um, different things that have to do with race um, in our country, different things that have to do with immigration policy, things like that, you're able to bring up that conversation and it's not necessarily shut down or one-sided you can show your perspective they bring their perspective um, as other students as well as your professor Um, and professors really do listen to what students say as well as vice versa obviously Um, so I like that it's a little bit more of an open campus when it comes to conversations like that Um, and like Tati said we do have our Howard Thurman Center and in that center we have every Friday something called coffee and conversations and they have a lot of different conversations about um, topics of diversity and about issues that are going on in our country so you can go there and have if you want to vent or if you have a particular um, viewpoint that you'd like to share things like that you can definitely go and have your voice heard Um, so that's one thing I would definitely say is a comment on our campus is people speaking up for what they want to share, what they believe in, things like that. And that's not 
um, just in social spaces. That's also extended to the academic settings too. Absolutely. Okay. And so we only have a few minutes left. So for our final question, um, I want to, and just know that if you sent in additional questions, you have them, we are always available, admissions at bu.edu. We also have ASCBBU at bu.edu. Uh, if you have questions for the students, Jade has given you the financial aid email address a bunch of times, so this is not the end uh, <laughs> in terms of your opportunities to ask questions, but I really want our students here to be able to give you advice. Uh, give the students advice that you wish you had heard, you would have heard uh, at the same point that they're at now, senior year. Uh, what what advice do you think would have been helpful for you to get at that point? About BU or about college? About college. College. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like yeah. 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 And 30 seconds. Honestly, um, something that someone did tell me when I was coming here, and I'm so grateful that they told me this. Um, I did a lot of college visits. I went to a lot of different schools in different regions. Um, and one of the things that I made sure to do after I stepped on campus, did the tour, did the panel, the whole thing, um, someone told me don't leave that school without asking someone who you feel like reflects you what their experience is like on that campus. So for me as a black um, girl, I went up to another black girl, I tapped her on the shoulder, I said, I'm so sorry, I feel like you're busy, but I'm applying to this school. What has your experience been like for you? And I did that at every one of my schools, and I got a range of answers. But I remember the girl that I tapped here at this school, she actually graduated, but she definitely gave me such a positive feedback about what her experience has been like and what her time has been like finding friends and things like that and how welcome she felt. And that was one of the things that really did convince me that this was a place that I wanted to be at. So whatever you identify with most, I'd recommend you do the same. Yeah, I guess kind of bouncing off of that, this isn't advice that I explicitly got, but it is something that I was constantly reminded of. And it's just to prioritize yourself, essentially, because when applying to schools, it's always the pressure of Am I going to a good school? Am I going to get into a good school? Where for me, I believe that no matter where you go, you're going to get a good education. But what's the most important is what you're going to do with that education and what you're going to do where you're getting your education that I think is like the most important. And so for me, it's like going to a space where you know that not only you're going to thrive academically, because yes, that is important in one sense, but college is a very dynamic four years of your life that is going to impact you for the rest of your existence, whether you like realize that or not. And so basically being in a space that's going to allow you to have that room to grow and all of that stuff is what's really, really important because no matter what you're studying at the end of the day, classes are just going to essentially be the same thing. Like you're, there's only so much you can learn in a biology class. There's only so much you can learn in a chemistry class to where it's really uniform, no matter where you're going to hear that lecture or hear that um, discussion section. But the people that you're going to be surrounded by and the people that you're going to learn from outside the classroom and just the place you're going to wake up every day is going to have such a huge effect on you that I feel like you just should know what you right now, even though you guys are what, only 17, 18 and still have a lot more growing to do, what you prioritize in yourself now and what you prioritize in your life right now is what really is going to help shape and change a lot of what you would learn at your school anyways. And so I think that's just something that's really important to kind of keep in mind is that, yes, you're young, but you also know what you want to do. You know, you have a good sense of self. And even if you don't, you're going to learn to cultivate that. And so going to a space where that's going to allow you to do that the most is what I think is the most important thing to kind of keep in mind. Right. And don't doubt yourself. No. If you know that you want a big school, you want a big school. Don't compromise um, whether you think something is not important or very important um, or someone is telling you something is important. What you is know what's important to you. And if you need those things in the environment you're going to be in for the next four years, look for that and don't compromise that. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And so for our final piece, again, if you have more questions, please, please, please reach out to us. This was just an hour long. I can't believe it's flown by, but we really want you to know that we're available for any additional questions that you have. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in and rocking with us. Um, and for those who end up watching this later, uh, we're glad that you're doing that as well. Continue to reach out to us. And thank you so much to our students and to Jay from Financial Aid. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Have a good night. Go be you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.